What does stuffing your hands filled with bullet ants, filing your teeth to kick the demons away, or joining a crocodile cult have in common? Well, the answer is simple. They're all parts of rituals that some might find surprising, like the bullet ants. The glove of the Satare Maui tribe consists of a ritual designated and designed to help young boys into men. The Maui tribe believes that any boy who wants to become a man must experience the worst pain the jungle has to offer. So boys as young as 12 would be set out into the tough rainforest terrain to gather bullet ants from the forest and submerge them into a natural sedative, rendering them unconscious. These large ants are then woven into the leaves as stingers facing towards the inside of the gloves, creating a bullet ant ridden pair of oven mitts. Unlike normal oven mitts that pick up the things that are hot, these are the inverse and are sharp instead. When the ants regain consciousness, the gloves are then placed of the young men undergoing the ritual, and the boy themselves must wear the glove 20 times for 10 minutes, all while performing a dance while those angry insects sting them. In summary, the boy must also accept as a man in the tribe, and this practice being endured could take a minute. According to the National Geographic, a bullet ant sting is so painful that on a pain scale, it is up to be 30 times more painful than a bee sting. The ceremony, the tribe chief says, is meant to show the men that a life lived without suffering, without any or without any type of effort, isn't worth out anything at all. When the bullet ant glove is finally removed, the boy will likely be in pain and shake uncontrollably for hours. He might even experience some muscle paralysis, disorientation, and hallucinations. This grueling trial is meant to prepare the boy for the traditional life of the tribe, where he will face all of the dangers the jungle has left to offer as a hunter and warrior for his tribe. Having vampire teeth is pretty cool, and after all, Bella, where have you been, Loka? But according to the locals, specifically for the Balinese people, it's neither Bella nor Loka. In the Indonesian population of Bali, there is a sacred religious practice in which the maxillary front teeth are filed for the purpose of refraining from evil lust. Note the teeth are flattened, not sharpened, and the aim of the ceremony is to symbolically cut down on the six negative traits that are inherited in humans. Lust, greed, wrath, pride, jealousy, and intoxication. Locally known as the Mepandes, or tooth filing ceremony, is essentially a ceremony in the life of the Balinese person. This is actually a ritual to remove the sharp edges of the canine teeth, which symbolizes the bad side of a person. This ritual cannot be done like a picking day to go to a dentist, but requires planning, preparations, and consulting a religious leader or priest. During this special day, the family will decorate the house with beautiful Balinese ornaments, like statues and pillars wrapped in white and gold cloth, gamelan ensembles and wayang shows are hired sometimes to perform and entertain the guests and family members along with serving delicious food. The invited guests and families then attend the ceremony will sometimes bring a gift or present in honor of that person. In the days of our modern day and age, the filing procedure is more symbolic. However, previously the teeth were intended and indeed filed down until the canine features were all gone. All rituals are accompanied by the Balinese through different life cycles and phases as every Balinese teenager has to do it. And it's one of the very important rituals of the life of the Balinese. Knees. It's recommended for this ceremony the person has to be around 6 to 18 years old, but the perfect time for girls is after their first menstruation. Some Balinese nowadays do perform this ritual later in life, as long as they haven't gotten married yet, and if a person passes away before performing this ritual, the family would perform the ceremony on the corpse before the cremation. When it comes to funeral practices, some may have the body tossed towards the sea, others buried beneath the ground, and for some cultures, believe in cremation. So we got water, earth, fire, but what about air? Considering they were also a big inspiration for Avatar The Last airbender, for the people in Tibet, there is a practice called sky burial. Sky burials are an ancient practice still widespread in Tibet. It is a funeral practice in which human corpses are placed on a mountain top to decompose while exposed to the elements or be eaten by scavenging animals, especially carrying on birds like vultures and corvids. Followers of Buddhism believe in reincarnation and Tibetan Buddhists believe that the body is just a shell after death as the spirit moves on. Tibetans also believe that death represents the end of one's life and a journey to the next, and they prepare for their spiritual journey from their body to another, also known as bardo. While many Buddhists believe in reincarnation can happen immediately after death, Tibetan Buddhists actually believe their spirits can travel up to 49 days, represented by the bardo levels, before finding a new incarnation. According to the bardo thodol, also known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, when one has died, it was believed that one is confronted by the deeds one has done in the life personified in forms of wrathful and peaceful entities. The practice of sky burial is believed to have practiced as many as long as 11,000 years, but there's little written evidence or physical evidence due to the fact that the remains were ingested by vultures or other animals. For Tibetans, the sky burial serves both as practical and spiritual functions. There's a lot of weird cults out there like the Church of Flying Spaghetti Monsters, also known as Pastafarianism, or the Spaghetti Cult, where they believe the world was created by a giant spaghetti monster. Although originating as a parody of religion in general, it was started by some guy who just wanted to eat spaghetti in Europe. Don't 
bought it touch my spaghetti. But for those who are living in Papua New Guinea, this is no joke. The crocodile cult is part of a ceremony conducted for the men in the tribes. In House Tambourine in Pigeon, it is also a place where important decisions regarding the villages are made, where the boys are initiated and become men in ceremonies to please the spirits that are performed. To them, the crocodile is worshipped as the water spirit. The water spirit. In excruciating, painful ceremonies, young men have their backs cut to resemble the markings of a crocodile, which is a symbol of strength and power. For these young men, not only does it signify strength, masculinity, and dedication to the tribe, but is also exclusively male practice that emphasizes the importance of brotherhood. According to their verbal history, an ancestor was hunting in a canoe and saw something in the water, so he dived deep into the water where he spotted a spirit house and within it lived a crocodile. The man remained with the crocodile for months, learning its secrets and power. And when the man returned to his village, he taught his people how to build spirit houses as well as to cut their skin to resemble a crocodile. Love hut is a phrase used time to time to distinguish edgy, cute couples in their suburban homes, but it's actually a thing in some cultures. Although parts of Africa practice it, the Zulus are especially noted for their bizarre take on the tradition. And during the latter stages of the courtship phase, as the father of the girl builds a separate hut where she and her suitor can meet at night. Far from being liberal, the father is actually quite strict in doing this, but building the hut, he does not allow the suitor into his home. Nor does he acknowledge the guy. But it's only when he has asked the daughter to get a cattle from her suitor does the father finally recognize his existence. And in this cases of the fathers of the Kuring tribe in Cambodia, northeast area of the other hand, are very liberal on that notion. Not only do they build the love huts for their daughters, they also encourage them to take in as many boys as they want until they finally find their true love. While this may sound kind of shocking and the incidences of non consensual intimacy results very low, and divorce actually is virtually non existent among the people. So the tribe actually value a long lasting marriage, hence the search through so many suitors. And so, after your love hut in Cambodia, you as a newlywed in Boreno might experience this ritual or tradition of not being allowed to leave your home for a few days, even to the washroom, you're not allowed to use at all. The Tindong people of Boreno abide by this tradition that is not only to do with the wedding ceremony in itself, but the honeymoon. Not following this ritual in Tindong culture is thought to bring bad luck to the bride and groom, often resulting in infidelity and the breakup of their marriage. The house arrest during the honeymoon is said to bring everlasting happiness to the marriage, as well as gracing the happy couple with many healthy and happy babies. We got the carrying your now consummated pregnant wife over a hot bed of spicy coals in China. Many tribes believe, and many Chinese tribes believe, that by walking over hot coals they can appease the gods and ward off any potential disasters such as floods, earthquakes, or droughts. Despite the potential risks involving walking over burning coals, the practice remains popular among many Chinese tribes. The tradition of walking over burning coals is said to date back thousands of years and is thought to have originated in the Han Dynasty. According to legend, a famous physician named Hua Tuo was also known for his ability to perform surgery without anesthesia. His attributed success to practicing walking over hot coals, which he believed helped him build up the resistance to pain. The belief is that walking over hot coals can help the wife have painless labor and is said to help build up her strength and resilience. So you've jumped over hot coals for your wife, now it's time to jump over the babies in Spain. Yes, celebrated each year in the small town of Castillo de Murcia, the Salto de Colacho is a week long celebration which cultivates a man dressed as the devil, terrorizing locals and jumping over their babies. El Colacho in Spain, also known as the Baby Jumping Festival, is a popular event that takes place in the town annually since 1620. By having infants born in the previous 12 months laid on mattresses and men dressed up as devils as they jump over them, the babies are supposed to be cleansed after their sins. Carrying whips and castanets to drive off the spirits, the devil will herd over 100 babies before chasing older children in the town square. The running starts as the clock strikes 6pm and the devil holds horse hair whips and castanets as they jump, which they use to drive away evil. The locals believe that evil spirits stick to the devil as they jump over the baby, as residents also hang white sheets from the balcony, which symbolizes purity and also hope that they will banish the devil. Babies, of course, lie very comfortably on rose petal covered mattresses and are blissfully unaware of the festivities. The devil also jumps over 100 newborns while 3,000 people watch from the sidelines. And no, no baby has been stepped. Speaking of Spain, they got another interesting festival involving tomatoes. The history of La Tomatina dates back to 1945 when some young people were attending a parade with musicians, giants and big head figures. One participant accidentally fell off the parade and he started to hit everything in its path. A furious crowd built up and a proper brawl occurred. There was a market of vegetables nearby and people just started hitting each other with tomatoes and after that it became a key marker with a fun wild time. 
In America, birthdays usually involve cake, ice cream, and singing a very bad song. I mean, it's not that bad. But in Jamaica, they throw flour on the birthday boy or girl. Legend says that it started as a birthday prank, but then it became a popular tradition over time. Often, they have thrown water onto the face first to ensure the flour really sticks. As is tradition officially and name of what it's called is called anti-king, and it's usually when you don't expect it. So if it's your birthday, be sure to carry some eggs, milk, and vanilla with you so that when you get that flour tossed in your face, you can make a cake. Which, to be honest, as I said, this is pretty unsure as to when this tradition has started, but whenever it was, it's now part of the present as much as it was part of history. And speaking of history, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. My name is Jess, and I wish you all the best. Bye.